Welcome to Shadow of Truth, and this is episode number 10. And we had told you all that we were going to have Dave Hodges from the Common Sense Show on as our second guest. Unfortunately, we've had to reschedule that interview with Dave, and that will be coming up on April the 1st. But we have on the line today Mr. Rob Kirby from Kirby Analytics, and we're going to be discussing who's behind the rigged markets. And of course, we have Dave Kranzler from Investment Research Dynamics, and my name is Rory Hall, and I'm with the DailyCoin.org. And ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Rob Kirby. Dave Veneroso used to be a very, very, very highly, and he still is considered a highly respectable international forensic, or I don't even know if forensic is, is the right word, but a renowned macroeconomist. And his clientele list reads central bank, major bank, major corporation. And, uh, you know, he used to hobnob around with the number two guy at the Bank of England. His name was Terry Smeaton. And in 1995, Terry Smeaton told Frank Veneroso that uh, uh, there, there was, uh, for the day, a remarkable amount of gold lending happening. And, and, and it was vectoring up in a very big way. And Frank understood that when gold was lent or leased, it left the vault. And it basically made its way into the supply chain. And Frank, you see, was doing work on gold with regard to uh, aggregate demand and aggregate supply, mine and scrap, uh, versus uh, countable demand. And he had ways to measure all that. And Frank's numbers at the time were very close to numbers being driven or or derived by the World Gold Council. But they were in direct opposition to another entity called GFMS, who, who seemed to, for whatever reason, understate global demand for gold. They, they, they got the supply side usually reasonably well, or they adjusted their supply side to to uh, account for their, let's just say, less robust demand side. And so back in the 90s, it can be said that GFMS and the World Gold Council did not see aggregate supply and demand data globally uh, on equal terms. And that got resolved in, in the late 1990s, 2000 timeframe when the World Gold Council basically threw their metrics out the window and adopted GFMS as their official uh, uh, statistics people for supply and demand. So that just left GFMS and the World Gold Council now teaming together uh, with numbers that weren't consistent with what Veneroso and Associates were putting out. And Frank, of course, became very famous in the late 90s when he put out his gold book. So moving this along... Frank had, had, uh, uh, had identified that demand was much, aggregate demand was much bigger than, than the, uh, you know, official agencies were reporting. And Frank reasoned that the only way this demand can be being met is by dishoarding of sovereign central bank gold hoards, and which is true because that's where it's been coming from. Then in 2007, Oh, oh, so wait, be, let, let's just stop off at 2004, because that's when GLD was created, or inception, and also happens to be the same year that the Rothschilds got out of the gold market, and Rothschilds uh, were synonymous for, for over 100 years with gold, or 200 years with gold, and they, they, you know, isn't it interesting that they got out of the market the same year that GLD was created? Perhaps, in my view, in my view anyway, this thing was too dirty for even the Rothschilds to touch. <clears throat> now, I have felt that GLD uh, uh, and the, the supporting evidence for me is that Frank Veneroso had done the work. Uh, understand, listen, Frank Veneroso's work was all foundational for the formation of GATA. And GATA started to really pipe and chortle about Frank's work around the millennium or just before. And uh, Frank then became sort of 
hooked or, or hinged to the conspiracy theorists. And this wasn't good for Frank's business because Frank's mainline business was doing macroeconomic research for central banks, big banks, and, uh, and Fortune 500 companies or big companies, megacorps. And so th this sort of strained Frank's uh, business because he was now being uh, associated with a bunch of uh, conspiracy people, which is why Frank has basically tried to distance himself. Uh, it, it makes sense. It wasn't good for business for Frank, but he was dead nuts on when he, when he, when he made all of his earlier prognostications. So then you move on along to the 2007 time frame, and Frank, in the, in the summer of 2007, Frank did a long research, published a long research paper, and he said he reckons that with the current rate of dishoarding of central bank gold, it should run out probably in about seven years, which takes you to 2014. But understand this, Frank never ever really came out and said that he thought that, for instance, uh, GLD was a fraud and allowed for more double counting because Frank doesn't go there. He's not a conspiracy theorist type of guy. My feeling right from the inception is that uh, GLD was, was, a, was a means to allow central banks to double count and basically to kick the can down the road a little further and extend the timeline uh, that Frank had, uh, had cited. But isn't it interesting, here we are now in early 2015, more or less on the timeline Frank gave us for when the gold would be gone, and now HSBC doesn't want to play. <laughs> like, you can't make it up, and it ain't a coincidence. <laughs> there is no such thing as a coincidence. <laughs> nah, it's just, like, the pieces fit together like a jigsaw puzzle. You know, and, the uh, picture, and the picture that the jigsaw puzzle is showing us is that we're moving, we're moving, likely transitioning into the end throw. I can confirm everything Rob just said about Benaroso because um, I remember when I first started getting into this world around 2001, I, I read everything that I could get my hands on from Benaroso. And most of his work that, that um, Rob alludes to, you can find in the on the gata.org website in their yeah. in their archives. I reread it all this morning. Yeah, I mean the guy's a brilliant guy. I mean, not only did he sort of disassociate himself with Gata back then, he also just kind of dropped out of sight altogether. He actually surfaced a couple years ago and he had published a couple reports that some people got off and they spread like wildfire around the internet and then he kind of disappeared from sight again. So Yeah, but he hasn't disappeared to uh, uh, Dave at all. He's, uh, he's, you know, Veneroso and Associates do their work. Like I said, he, you know, he doesn't, he doesn't want to be affiliated with conspiracy theory. It's not good for his business. When, when your mainline business is consulting with central banks and, and large commercial banks, uh, you don't want to be known as a conspiracy guy. Or just oh, I agree, telling especially because all of his basically confirms everything that Gata has been saying. Um, it, it confirms the fact that GLD is basically a fraud. I mean, I did a report on GLD in 2009. I basically um, built upon the original work that James Turk did when the original prospectus came out in 2004, and I went through that thing line by line, and I showed exactly where the legal language gave GLD a wide berth to hypothecate and lease out gold. Exactly. So, and I've been meaning to update it because they changed the prospectus again. And Alistair McLeod is actually the guy who caught it in, uh, I think it was like 2010 or 2012. And they both SLV and, and GLD made their, their, made it even easier for both trusts to not be held accountable. Oh, yeah. And then not to mention the fact that SLV also expanded its prospectus to allow silver to be safe kept at New sure. York Comex vaults, which makes it easier for JP Morgan to play hide the salami with, with the silver that it's, it's supposed to be the custodian of in the SLV vault. So, so they can well, keep the SLV silver in the Comex vaults. Is that what you said? 
They, yeah, they can keep some of it there. Originally, it was all supposed to be kept in London at, at a vault that J.P. Morgan is the custodian of. And then they expanded the ability to keep silver at the Comex vaults. Yeah, but this this is the whole thing. We don't we don't know how much double counting there is. You see, but we do know they double count because the, the even the uh, even the BIS has acknowledged and said that you know sovereign banks should differentiate. Uh, sovereign central banks should differentiate on their balance sheets the difference between gold that's been leased out and uh, uh, and gold that's present in the vault, but but nobody's done so. So we know they do it. We we know for a fact that they count leased gold which has left the vault on the same line as any gold that's in the vault, and that's double counting. Right. They they actually used to have separate line items for it and then the then the rules were changed so that lease receivables could were just um, aggregated into gold gold that's owned yeah it's called gold holdings or something like that that line yeah item. yeah to, just to circle back to the hsbc thing for a second and i wouldn't i would have i forgot about this except one of my blog readers sent me an article from the the telegraph the telegraph uk from 2009 and the headline is HSBC starts gold rush as it kicks small clients out of its vaults. And it's an article about how they, I remember it now, now that I read the article, when HSBC closed all of its retail gold vaults in New York, and they said they were going to focus on the institutional business. And ironically, that kind of coincided with the big move in the price of gold from 800 to 1900 over the next two years, basically, two and a half years. Well, flat, fast forward to today, and there's still some people who don't believe that HSBC is actually closing seven of its eight London gold vaults. And then Ned Naylor Leyland called the bank and got a hold of a PR person who said, yeah, well, we're, we're basically just closing down seven retail repositories. Well, yeah. I mean, that's obviously... Orwellian fog being blown because a repository is the same thing as a depository. Interestingly, the narrative that they're giving us now that it was retail gold holdings that they're that they're closing out, you know, as being the custodian of, completely contradicts with this 2009 article where they said they were getting out of the retail gold depository business in 2009 to focus on institutional. Yeah. So what's the truth now, HSBC? We know I don't what you're know. Doing. Now, now, why don't you explain to us why why you're telling us something that's different than what we already have in print? Well, because well, what I find gold. Uh, uh, what I find funny is that the uh, uh, the Rothschilds exit the market in 2004, and at the time, they they wanted us to believe that there was just no no future in uh, in gold. I think trading volumes have mushroomed since 2004. Uh, obviously, the Rothschilds didn't see that coming. Uh, well, especially you know, paper gold trading. Yeah, well, exactly, but that's sort of my point. My my point is they didn't they didn't want to be around when this thing blew up. Yes, and I now agree. it's now it seems that HSBC feels the same way. They don't want to be around when the when the when the crap hits the fan blades because they don't want to get smattered with it. Yes. Now, how does this tie into the new London uh, gold fix? I mean, because you've got, there's two or three things that you have that are happening all, all at once. The fact that HSBC is, has announced that they are closing seven retail gold vaults, or I'm sorry, repositories, and on March the 20th, which is uh, eight days from now, the new London gold fix goes into goes into play oh isn't it Roy? isn't it isn't it amazing how we always get whenever things look wrong or don't make sense we get new new and improved it's like it's like when when the world started to figure out that the cia had invented al-qaeda and we're funding al-qaeda and we're arming al-qaeda suddenly al-qaeda splintered into isis il uh the muslim brotherhood uh I don't know how many derivations and 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 people's heads started getting chopped off, you know. And it and it's and it's you notice it's sort of the same thing 
when when it when inflation numbers needed to be really managed, they just changed the way they measured inflation. Right. And when unemployment seemed too high, they they just changed the way unemployment was was measured. And you see, this way you can just move the goalpost back thirty yards, have a person standing on the thirty yard line who's now facing a 60-yard go, and you tell them, look, it's just a 30-yard chip shy. Yeah. <laughs> You're standing on the 30. Look, it's marked right there. It, Have it, fun it, kicking it into the breeze. I mean, it's just a joke. It is a joke. But this is what they do. They have, the, 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 you know, this is not a conspiracy theory. This is nothing but fact. This 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 speaks directly to the to the great work that John Williams has done. Have you noticed how not one respectable economist anywhere in the world will debate John Williams on the on the veracity or validity of his work? Not one ever anywhere. <laughs> That's because I mean, it speaks volumes. Exactly. Well, his it work, speaks volumes. It, it speaks the truth. Yes, it and does. You can't argue with the truth. No. No, you can't. So, you know what? One thing that we have on our side, not that we always get everything 100% correct, but what we do have on our side is the truth. And we do have the big picture absolutely accurate. And you know what? There's a lot of trolls out there that want to say that we're a, we're a conspiracy cult. And you know what? And those people want to go around with their heads buried in the sand or shoved up their uh, derriers, all the power to them. That's fine. Well, you know, um, Eric King makes a, makes a great case that a lot of these guys that are trolls are actually sort of, they get paid by the CIA to go around to blogs like mine and post disruptive comments. Yes, that's already been proven that they are, there's, there's, that's documented. I mean, Jeffrey Christian would be the perfect example of that. Well, yeah, he's I mean, he is. Well, if you guys if you guys have uh, taken the taken the time, I mean, I've done it about a dozen times, and I get something new out of it every time I do it. But watch watch the uh, uh, expose that uh, Eric De Carbonell did on the ESF Exchange Stabilization Fund. And it's posted on his website called marketskeptics.com in the right-hand column. It's a series of five YouTube uh, videos. And uh, this guy knows a thing or two about how finance is conducted in the USA. His great-grandfather was Frank Vanderlip. Frank Vanderlip was one of the original framers, a Jekyll Island participant, a framer of the uh, Fed Reserve Act. And... He's done, he's done some impressive research on the Exchange Stabilization Fund and the way it works and the clandestine methods it uses. And, uh, the, you know, sort of in summary, he says that much of what we read about the uh, uh, transgressions in the international money markets and capital markets that are attributed to the Fed uh, are indeed the work of the Exchange Stabilization Fund. The ESF uh, prefers to have the Fed take all the flack and all the publicity, um, and it's it's a it's sort of a it's a symbiotic relationship. The uh, Federal Reserve, specifically the New York Fed Trading Desk, serves as the the prime broker for the Exchange Stabilization Fund and executes all of their orders that they they do in public markets or in private markets. And uh, much of what we see that people attribute to the Fed is indeed the work of the ESF. People should remember, and I've had this discussion with Dave before in writing, where, 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 we, have a, where we have a bit of a, a dialogue back and forth about who's really behind the rigging of the markets. My contention is that it's the exchange stabilization fund that runs it all. And Dave has said to me, he thinks, tends to lean more towards it being the Fed. And I think at one point, Dave, you might have even said to me, it doesn't really make a difference. In my view, it makes a huge difference, and I'll give you the reason why. The Fed is uh, basically put before Congress twice a year under oath, and they give testimony. So to a point, um, 
you know, they are at least quasi or in theory somewhat accountable. But the Exchange Stabilization Fund was created in 1934 by an act of Congress. And it, when it was created, it was seeded with money that, uh, or, or, or balances that came about as, uh, from, from the confiscation of gold from the American people. And then it was revalued up. And that revaluation of the gold stock created a $2 billion windfall back in 1934, which is an enormous amount of money back then. That was the seed money for the ESF. That, that $2 billion has been, has been growing without taxation, without producing year-end financials now since 1934, damn near 100 years coming up on it. And these guys operate above all laws. They, 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 are not, they are not accountable to Congress. They never give testimony. And they're operated at the sole discretion of the uh, tre secretary treasurer and, uh, you know, with input from the executive. So this, this, is, this, is your, this is your prototypical dictionary definition of a black hole in, 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 in money matters. <clears throat> and I, what I would suggest people consider is that when the exchange stabilization fund is acting in markets, using the Fed as their broker, if the Fed is called out on the orders that they've passed to banks, the Fed can turn around and say, we've had nothing to do with anything in the market, because they haven't, they're because not. they're acting as an agent for, for the exchange stabilization fund. Right. This, but this also is why the Fed will always resist being audited. Because if the Fed is ever audited, it will show the actions that they've taken on behalf of the Exchange Stabilization Fund. And this will never allowed, be allowed to see the, the day of light. It won't happen. And, th and that's why. Uh, but and anyway, actually, that, that, Rob, I, I completely agree with you. But I, I would almost argue that the Fed and the Treasury are almost one and the same anyway. I mean, yes. the, Fed, yes. the Federal Reserve is supposed to be this body, this private organization, independent organization, body of economists. It's not. They're all they're all political animals. Yes. Now, I, I know that, um, I, and I, I wish I had saved it, but someone, I, I guess um, Bernanke's schedule or something, or maybe it was the, the um, <clears throat> schedule of the Office of the Treasury, was released a couple years ago, and it showed that Bernanke used to go visit the Treasury almost every day. And here's the other thing. The Exchange Stabilization Fund's offices are in the same building as the New York Fed in New York City. That sounds like a coincidence to me, Dave. Just a, just a mere coincidence, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I, I, I agree with you. I do think that ultimately it's 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 the sort of the 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 merger between the Treasury and the Fed, and they use the New York Fed as their as their operating entity. Yeah, no, it's the it is the brokerage arm of the Treasury. Absolutely, yes, exactly, exactly. Yeah, when and, you see. You see, Dave, when you when you want to buy stock or want to want to sell stock or or buy bonds, you know, you call Schwab. When the Exchange Stabilization Fund wants to make interest rates go down, they call the New York Fed and they tell them that they want to do uh, interest rate derivatives of such uh, such and such magnitude, and and then the Fed parcels the orders out to the banks. The New York Fed has one of the most high-tech and advanced trading floors in the world. A, a couple years ago, they ran an ad in in one of the one of the specialty magazines soliciting resumes from from you know the PhD rocket scientists who wanted to go to Wall Street and make millions rather than go and try and <clears throat> work on things that actually advance mankind. Here, here. <laughs> So um, another topic that I just wanted to cover briefly, Rob, was um, I, I just wanted to get your take on um, what you think the fact that the U.S. dollar is now going parabolic indicates. Because in my opinion, it indicates that something is melting down behind the scenes. I mean, as we all know, parabolic markets eventually 
rip in reverse the other way. And the dollar's behaving almost exactly like it did in, in the summer of 2008 before the Lehman collapse. So I was just curious well, what, your, what your view on this was. And, and, and I'm going to respond to that uh, uh, prompt in this way. It was about a year and a half ago when the dollar was still extremely weak. And I think it was Greg Hunter who asked me, what do you see happening with the dollar? I said, the dollar will go supernova. And, you know, that's really what, what has occurred. It, the dollar looks like a Roman candle. And we all know what happens to Roman candles after the ball shoots up high into the night. It disappears. And at some point here, the dollar is going to disappear. And it's not so much the dollar. I'm not trying to single out the dollar. But the dollar is basically representative of fiat, fiat money in general. And I look at the fiat, the fiat world in aggregation, not just dollar-centric. And the reality is when you're considering monetary aggregates in this day and age, you can no longer look at one central bank balance sheet in isolation. They all have to be looked at in aggregate because they're all interconnected with swap lines and, and, and et cetera. And the, the, the growth or life cycle of fiat money is such that it, uh, the, the, the supply of fiat in existence grows uh, gently upward to the right until it reaches an inflection point and then it does what's called a hockey stick maneuver where it bends and it goes vertical and then and then the money supply must grow vertically or the whole system implodes and we are on that part of the curve right now and we have been for some time and the the aggregate amount of money in the world is growing vertically it will continue to grow vertically until everybody wakes up and realizes it's going to be worth nothing. How does this tie into the fact that China has been making it very, been making loud calls about the RMB being world currency and these billboards that are showing up uh, in Bangkok and in various places in, um, in Asia and as well as all of their acquisition of gold over the, over the past well, decade in particular? Well, that's like that's like a, that's like a dot to dot. That's about two two dots. It's not hard to connect. It, it it would it would certainly have all the odor of appearing like China is positioning itself to step into the breach when the current fiat system fails and to conceivably back their currency with gold, which would be, if not purely, at least a quasi return to the gold standard. I do believe that something of this nature is in our offing in the near future. And it would seem to me that the Chinese are smart enough to uh, be positioning themselves to, to uh, take such a position on. Timing on these things is never going to be exact or perfect. But, you know, we do know, we do know that the existing financial order is creating money at a parabolic vertical pace and most people i think who have their head screwed on right or have a have an iq bigger than their shoe size realize that when you grow something at a vertical clip uh it's not a it's not sustainable and but all i'm going to say is when you you increase the, the 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 amount of something by an infinite rate you don't usually end up with the, that said good being worth more, uh, you know, than in earlier times. And uh, that's where we're headed with the dollar. And there's no doubt in my mind that the dollar, along with its other derivative fiat counterparts, will ultimately uh, achieve their true intrinsic values, which is zero. So if you don't have gold, you better get some quick. That's what I'd say. <laughs> I hate to cut it off because it's... it's really incredible but we're we're getting a little long for the show that we're doing rob and i hope i hope that we can pick this uh conversation up in the very near future 
to uh, to continue moving it forward. I suspect there will probably come a day when we will have no choice but to do just that. <laughs> Well, I like the sound of that. And we've been speaking with uh, Mr. Rob Kirby of KirbyAnalytics.com. And Rob, it's been a pleasure. My pleasure being with you guys.